Hello everyone, I'm Mark Plotkin, Dr. Mark Plotkin of the Amazon Conservation Team. I'm an ethnobotanist, that is a scientist who works with indigenous peoples to study and try and understand their use of important and powerful plants, the so-called plants of the gods. I'm proud to report that thanks to you guys, we've crossed way north of 500,000 downloads, that's a half a million downloads. So clearly there's a hunger out there for more information on these hallucinogenic, entheogenic, magical, mind-altering uh, plants. And that's why we're all here. Today we're talking about one of the most intriguing plants of all, that is tobacco. And many people don't include tobacco when they talk about hallucinogenic and entheogenic plants. The series was inspired by my mentor, Richard Evan Schultes, the late great Harvard ethnobotanist. And in his classic work, co-authored with Albert Hoffman, the inventor of LSD, and the person who first isolated psilocybin from the magic mushrooms that Chilties brought back from Oaxaca. Uh, they didn't include tobacco in their book, Plants of the Gods. Plants of the Gods is the Bible if you're an ethnobotanist. And I want to talk about why I think tobacco is a plant of the gods. And I point out that this reflects back to a, a point that I've been made, making several times, that other plants and plant products like wine and rum also need to be considered plants of the gods. So the reason I'm telling you this is I want people to refer back to the episodes of the Plants of the Gods podcast, which is found uh, in all your favorite podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, very easy to find. And look at some of the Facebook lives that we've done in the past as well. We did a particularly memorable one on rum with Beach Bumberry. Beach Bumberry is really the, the deity of tiki culture, uh, but you have to check back to that episode to learn more about why I make that claim. And I think uh, most of my fellow tiki enthusiasts would uh, back me up on that. Now, from what I've learned of, of these sort of social media outreaches, I realize that people sometimes dial in who haven't done so before. And it's always useful for us to find out where people are dialing in from. So my request to all of you out there in listener land is to please put in the chat where you're dialing in from. It's also uh, interesting and of use to me and to the team at Deb Mitchell Associates, who really is responsible for the logistics of these types of sessions, to find out, have you been listening to these all along? Is this your first time? Uh, also, because I don't want this to be a lecture, I want it to be a conversation. I invite you to uh, put comments in the comments section about what we'd really like to hear more about next time. I had several requests for coffee, uh, some requests about Amazonian rubber. Uh, Dr. Christopher McCurdy, who is one of the world authorities on Kratom or Kratom, uh, has offered to do an interview. And we have a special treat for those of you particularly interested in Amazonian shamanism and tobacco. My friend and colleague, Dr. Glenn Shepard, uh, just concluded a two-part interview focusing on tobacco and ayahuasca shamanism in the Amazon. So uh, this is something you definitely aren't going to want to miss. And I'll be talking a little bit about Glenn in the course of uh, in the course of the discussion today. So I want to introduce my uh, dear colleague Antonio Peluzzo, who works with me here at the Amazon Conservation Team. He's really my wingman on these podcast uh, and Facebook Live episodes, along with. Uh, Kenza, who is his partner in crime. So it really is a team. I never want to give the impression that my work uh, at the Amazon Conservation Team or podcast is a one-man show. In fact, when we found the, uh, the name for the organization 26 years ago, we chose Amazon Conservation Team because even though 
we like to think of individuals who can make a difference. Uh, it's always teamwork. Uh, as great as Schultes was as an ethnobotanist, he couldn't have done it by himself. He always had indigenous teachers and guides. So hello, Antonio, and thank you for joining us and help you uh, midwife us along in terms of, of tonight's conversation. So please put in the, the chat where you're tuning in from. I'm proud to say that we've got a number of countries represented. In the past, we've had people from Australia. We have a loyal following in Colombia and Mexico. Um, but this is a universal discussion, at least that's the intent. So anyone anywhere interested in culture, hallucinogens, healing, conservation, uh, should have an interest in what we're discussing. So please chime in with your questions, your comments, your criticisms, your ideas, because I said this is meant to be a conversation, not a straight lecture. So I want to talk about tobacco, and I am the one who calls tobacco a plant of freedom and enslavement, uh, which as far as I know, uh, is the first time it's been called that, but I hope to make the case as to why that's the case. Uh, why is, welcome, uh, uh, Nuestro Amigo de Jalisco, uh, welcome to our friend from Australia. I, I definitely want to do uh, 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 our colleague from Minnesota. Hello, Jason. I definitely plan to do uh, a uh, Iowa. Well, we, we cover a lot of ground here. I definitely want to do an episode on hallucinogens of Mexico and Colombia, both because I, I both know and love those countries. Uh, Schulte said, well, if you're a Muslim, uh, a follower of Islam, you have to go to Mecca. But if you're an ethnobotanist, you need to go to Mexico and Colombia. And while we have uh, our colleagues tuning in from Australia, I will point out that uh, tobacco, best known as a plant of the New World Tropics, was also used originally by the Aborigines as a stimulant, that they chewed tobacco as well. Now, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of species of tobacco in the New World, primarily in South America, but there's some in Africa and, and some in Australia. So I want to credit our Aboriginal colleagues for discovering this uh, long before scientists like myself did. I also want to point out that we talk about tobacco. You know, it, 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 Americans are very parochial people. We don't really understand the world at large. At least we don't very well, most of us. But tobacco, which of course, uh, if you're close to my age, I'm 67, you think of as an American plan, American cigarettes, uh, Paul Mall, Philip Morris. Tobacco is not from North America. Tobacco is from South America. And there are dozens of species of tobacco, but two that I wanna focus on uh, today, Nicotiana tobaccum, as you see here, and Nicotiana rustica. Well, let me explain why that's important. First of all, these are based on species which originated in central South America, that is uh, the Andes. So tobacco is not native to Virginia or North Carolina. Tobacco, as we know it, is native to probably Bolivia, Peru, uh, that part of Central South America, south of the Amazon, east of the Andes. But the, the story is, is unfolding. I mean, the, the genetics, the archaeology, this is, it's kind of hard to lecture on this stuff when you realize that new finds are being made all the time. And let me tell you about the greatest find in ethnobotany in the last year. Scientists working in Northwest Utah found tobacco remains that had been used 12,300 years ago. Now that is mind blowing, literally, on many fronts. First of all, because there's some people who say that the first indigenous peoples came to the Americas 10,000 years ago. Well, the first Americans who came to North America were very unlikely the ones that went to Western Utah straight away and started smoking cigarettes or chewing tobacco leaves. So what this means is the timeline of when indigenous peoples first arrived in the America goes back a lot further than many people think. Second of all, the archaeoethnobotany, that is the reconstruction of what the ecosystem looked like, showed that that part of northwestern Utah, Utah was quite lush, which it isn't now. And I got to say, there's some sort of cosmic irony here. Here is Utah, where people from the Church of Latter-day Saints do not use tobacco. And so the earliest tobacco in the Americas is found in use in Utah. So I, I find that uh, endlessly amusing. So why is tobacco the plant of freedom? It is first and foremost because shamans use tobacco in the Amazon where I work 
to escape their earthly bonds. And let me quote, let me quote Glenn Shepard. And again, for those of you who are joining us relatively recently, Shepard is the preeminent expert on the use of tobacco and shamanic cultures in the Amazon. And I want to encourage all of you to uh, check out the new Plant of the Gods episode, the podcast episode, because in the end notes, it has several of Shepard's papers on tobacco. He's a wonderful writer, and it will give you much more uh, detail. But let me quote Glenn Shepard on tobacco and why uh, shamans use tobacco and other hallucinogenic entheogenic plants. Quote, not even the sky is the limit. The greatest shamans ascend beyond the heavens to mingle with immortal spirit beings, the very gods of creation, who defend and perpetuate the universe through their ceaseless war against the forces of chaos and evil. And that's poetry. But this is, again, explains the role of the shaman. She or he is the person. Oh my God, we have somebody from Utah. I hope I didn't step on any toes. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, Paturi is the, is the um, Aboriginal use of, of tobacco and tobacco relatives. But the shaman is the, the woman or the man who is the medicine woman or man who sort of mediates between the everyday world that we live in and the spirit world, the invisible world, the placebo world, whatever you want to call it. But it's the shaman who is responsible for taking these mind altering plants and visiting the heavens, visiting hell and finding out what the future holds, bringing good luck, bringing good luck in the hunt, controlling the weather, finding lost objects, all of these cool things that us mere mortals don't know how to do. Now, why is tobacco a plant to freedom? I gave you the shamanic explanation, my perspective, why tobacco is a plant of freedom. But here's something very cool that's not very often covered in the history books. Because in Western culture, so lucrative was the trade in tobacco in colonial America that it essentially funded the development of a wealthy and educated class of Virginia landowners who then spearheaded the American Revolution. Fully 25% of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence were tobacco farmers, including Presidents Washington, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. Let me say that again. Tobacco is the ultimate plant of freedom because it allowed the creation of a wealthy white landowner class who fought for freedom from Great Britain, who wrote the Declaration of Independence, and four American presidents were tobacco growers in Virginia. But here's the terrible irony. Tobacco was the plant of enslavement because the way these fortunes were created was through the evil institution of slavery. So on the one hand, you have these men who set the standard for freedom around the world, but for the most part, they were, they were slave owners. So this is a terrible irony of tobacco, which is seldom pointed out in the history books. Why else is tobacco a plant of enslavement? Everybody knows the answer. It's addictive. Nicotine, the active alkaloid in tobacco, is one of the most addictive substances known. How do we discover, discover uh, tobacco and nicotine? Columbus sent two of his men into the interior of Cuba on his first voyage. This would have been, I think, November 5th, 1492. And they came back and described something that they had never seen before, that the indigenous peoples, the Taino, and I know we have some Taino dialing in today, were doing something with smoke they'd never seen before. They were swallowing the smoke. They were drinking the smoke. Now we say they were smoking. But if you go back and read the accounts in Spanish, they didn't have a verb for it. Fumando is the, the verb we'd use today. Saludos a la Ciudad de México. And uh, I don't know if, if you just joined, George, but... I talked about Mexico as one of the meccas for the ethnobotanists and that the most important statue in the entire science of ethnobotany is in the Anthropological Museum of Mexico, which is one of the world's great museums. And it is a statue called Xochipilli. It was the Aztec god of flowers and hallucinogens. And whenever I go to Mexico City, I pay a pilgrimage by going right to the museum and seeing Xochipilli. And Xochipilli is so important to us ethnobotanists that he's featured on the cover 
of Schultes and Hoffman's book, Plants of the Gods. So Xochipilli uh, was dug up on the slopes of Mount Popocatapetl, spelled like it sounds, second highest volcano in Mexico, uh, home to an indigenous uh, variety of mushroom that's found on the slopes of the volcano. And when Schultes first looked at Xochipilli, he said, it's not just the god of flowers, he's the god of hallucinogenic flowers, because there's seven hallucinogens carved on Xochipilli's body, uh, not just flowering plants, but a magical mushroom. And for purpose of our discussion today, uh, tobacco. Tobacco flower is one of them. So La Tarea, the homework for everybody, if you haven't done so, is to go to Mexico, go to the Museum of Anthropology and visit Xochipilli and see this stuff in person. But my team is saying to remind people, please tell us where you're dialing in from because the way that these Facebook live session work is people come in late, people leave early. So it's not a linear discussion as if we were having a lecture in some classroom where everybody there at the beginning and hopefully there at the end. Uh, how addictive is nicotine? Uh, Mark Twain had a great quote about it. He says, giving up tobacco and nicotine is the easiest thing in the world. He says, I know, I've done it hundreds of times. So clearly it's a very addictive substance. And then you have the question, well, if these shamans are smoking nicotine in healing sessions, how come they're not addicted or are they addicted? And how come they don't get cancer if they don't get cancer? Well, I asked the great shaman of the Kamaya Ra tribe, this is in the Shingu, X-I-N-G-U, in the southeastern Brazilian Amazon, they smoke these big uh, honking shamanic cigars of, about a foot long. And so I said to the shaman, well, why don't you get cancer? You smoke this stuff all the time. And he said, I'll show you. So he gave me one of the cigars and we smoked it. Gave me quite a buzz. And then the he gave me this, at the end, he gave me this stuff to drink. He said, I drink this and drink it fast, which I did. And then I puked my guts out. And he said, one of the reasons that people like you, gringos or foreigners or white people or black people or non-indigenous peoples get cancer is you don't purge. To them, the idea of purges is very important. This is very much embedded in this whole um, culture of using antigens. I mean, anybody who's taken ayahuasca, which seems to be just about everybody these days, they know what the purge is, uh, out the front or out the back. But the shamans say this is good for your health. And in this culture, among the Kamayura, the other indigenous peoples of the Shingu, who don't take any hallucinogens we know of, other than smoking these cigars, uh, they definitely purge on a regular basis, which is really not uncommon in a lot of these uh, shamanic ceremonies. Now, when tobacco was brought to uh, North America, it was replacing another tobacco. And as I said, there's two species that are in common use. There's Nicotiana tobacco, which is what's used around the world. It's what's in cigars. It's one of the cigarettes. And it's Nicotiana rustica. Now, here's the difference. Nicotiana rustica has between nine and ten times as much uh, nicotine. What's the difference? That means when you smoke a cigarette, you might, you know, get a little bit of a buzz. When you smoke nicotine, Nicotiana rustica, you definitely get a buzz. Why is that relevant or interesting? When I was a kid growing up in New Orleans in the 60s, I used to watch TV's endless shows and movies about cowboys and Indians. And you'd always have the ceremony where the indigenous chief would want to have friendship or create a bond, and he would light the peace pipe, uh, which is also known as a calumet or a calume. He would take a hit, and then he would pass it to the next person, go all around the circle. And... Uh, that, that just struck me sort of a quaint custom. But as an ethnobotanist, after being trained in the science, I know why they did that. Because when you take a hint of Nicotiana rustica, you needed to go around the circle to clear your head because the stuff's so strong. And this was the primary mind-altering substance taken by the Eastern Woodland Indigenous peoples. So this smoke in the peace pipe was Eastern North America. But ironically, and, and I, I want to go to a question soon, when this plant was domesticated, it was domesticated in Central South America. But by the time Columbus and the other Europeans got to the Americas, 1492 and after that, they were growing tobacco from Southern Alaska 
to northern Chile. Imagine that, okay? This is in a culture that had no horses, no wheels, no roads, and it was being grown over a 7,000 mile stretch. That's how important it was. And so when we find these early digs, like I mentioned earlier in Utah, 12,300 years ago, they're growing tobacco. Peter First, who's an ethnobotanist still around, in 1979 first wrote, tobacco was probably the first cultivated plant. And uh, that may surprise some people. It might have been the first plant that was cultivated. And he says, if you understand shamanic ceremonies, you wouldn't be surprised that the first priority was feeding the soul rather than feeding the stomach. Uh, very quaint quote. So uh, I want to go to a question or two, and I want to uh, invite our listeners to submit questions or comments so we make this as uh, interactive as possible. So Antonio, do you have a question for us? Yeah, first question. Thank you, Mark. Um, I know you kind of mentioned this already, but do you smoke? And if so, what's your favorite form or version of consuming tobacco? Well, that's another aspect of tobacco that is pretty mind boggling. And again, I mean that literally. You know, we think of tobacco as something you smoke. You smoke cigarettes, you smoke cigars. Uh, not so many people smoke a pipe. But tobacco is used in those types of forms and more. My favorite is what's known as ambil. In the Colombian Amazon, they take tobacco leaves and they boil them down to make a paste uh, to where it's kind of tarry. And so when you're in the Amazon with your indigenous colleagues, they'll take out a little uh, aluminum can, take off the top, and there's this tobacco paste in it. And they'll rub it on the finger and they rub it on the gums, the upper gum, underneath the lip. And it is quite stimulating, but it's almost always used in, in companion with mambe, which I covered in our coca lecture and uh, our coca episode is one of our most popular episodes on Plants of the Gods. Again, uh, our episodes, our podcast episodes are available at all the most popular plat platforms, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and others. And so tobacco, I mean, it's just seldom used alone, like we would smoke a cigarette. But they are always using tobacco with coca powder uh, or uh, as part of an ayahuasca ceremony. Um, the Yanomami peoples that I've had the honor and privilege of living with on the Brazil-Venezuela border take a leaf of tobacco and they roll it up and they stick it under their lower lip. So if you ever took an anthropology class and you saw Napoleon Chagnon's classic film, the Yanomami always look like this. And that's because they have a tobacco leaf rolled up under their, under their lip. And Chagnon wrote that this is considered so important by the Yanomami that their phrase for poor or poverty means without tobacco. And so he once told me, he said, yeah, well, a bunch of guys kept coming over. They'd never seen material goods. And they're asking me for a shotgun. They're asking me for this again. And I told him, I can't give everything away because I'm poor. And three of them took the tobacco quit out of their, their mouth and stuck it up to them like here. We can fix that. Uh, Chimo is another name for this ambulance. It's used in adjacent uh, Venezuela. And uh, there's even records of tobacco uh, being taken as an enema. So I want to say, folks, don't try this at home. Uh, Mark, we have a clip to share, um, if you're ready for that. Yep. Right. Yeah. That night was the last of the expedition, and we were on the river until daybreak, recording data about the small caimans we were able to catch. George the boatman beached the canoe, and we were scratching our mosquito bites as the sun rose a soft but fiery red over the rainforest-covered mountains to the east. When he finished unloading the equipment, George reached under his seat and pulled out a small aluminum can. Using his right thumb to push off the tightly capped lid, he poured the viscous black liquid into his left palm and then noisily snorted it up. His eyes rolled back, his right leg began to twitch. When he returned to reality several minutes later, I was still standing there watching him. He smiled, adjusted the angle of his hat, and passed me the can. Your turn, he said. This was the moment of truth. 
To decline would be rude, to accept foolhardy. Thousands of questions raced through my mind. Never in a classroom had I been taught what to do in such a situation. In the years that followed, I would have shaman swing machetes at my neck, treat my various illnesses with jungle plants, and blow copious amounts of hallucinogenic snuff deep into my nostrils. But I knew nothing yet. I stuck out my hand. With a slight grin, George poured the black liquid into my palm. I rapidly snorted the dark potion. In the back of my throat, I tasted a bitter substance, but this was soon forgotten. I felt the blood coursing through my veins and felt increasingly omniscient and all-powerful. I was a rocket blasting off, and with each passing second, I felt higher, faster, stronger, and more alive. But after a short voyage, I ran out of fuel. First, I felt weak, then slow, then queasy, then outright nauseous. I broke out in a sweat, collapsed on the ground, and vomited three times. Half an hour later, I'd made enough of a recovery to stagger back to my hut and stumble into my hammock. Despite persistent nausea and a slight ringing in my ears, I fell into a deep yet restless sleep. When I awoke several hours later, my colleague Mittermeier had already packed our things for the return trip. George came by and gave a hearty laugh when he saw my still green complexion. What the hell was in that, I asked, somewhat uncertainly. My secret recipe, he replied. The leaves of the tobacco bush and the ashes of the maho cochon tree. Would you like some more? George pulled the can out of a pocket in his shorts and offered it to me. Before I could vehemently decline, he burst out laughing. I can so that as if it was yesterday. That's a quote from my first book, Tales of a Shaman's Apprentice. And, you know, growing up, I was surrounded by smokers. I mean, my mother was a chain smoker. Everybody was a chain smoker. Let me put a question out to the audience. How many of you guys have ashtrays in your house? I don't know anybody who has an ashtray. When I was a kid growing up, everybody had ashtrays everywhere. So times definitely change. But instead of regarding tobacco with disgust, as I grew up doing, I've come to take a very different view in having the chance to live with these cultures. For example, about two months ago, I was in Oaxaca. This is southern Mexico, where my mentor, Schultes, discovered, discovered, remember, ethnobotanists discover things because they're indigenous teachers and God show it to them. That's where he first encountered the magic mushroom, where he brought it back. And eventually, the uh, great chemist, Albert Kaufman, did the chemical analysis and found the uh, secret ingredient, which was psilocybin. Now, psilocybin is so important now in the psychedelic renaissance as a treatment for so many things which once were considered incurable, from PTSD to uh, anorexia to depression, that my pal Paul Stamets, who's also been on the podcast, calls it the Einstein molecule. But I was deep in ceremony with uh, the Mazatecs, who are the masters of the mushrooms, and I got in trouble. It, it, things took a very dark turn. And the shaman saw what was happening and grabbed my arm, rolled up my sleeves, and began rubbing green tobacco into the inside of my arm, which he said was his way of uh, giving me protection and keeping uh, away uh, the dark spirits are keeping the dark spirits at bay. Now, as a scientist, I don't understand what he's doing, but hey, here I am, it worked. So that once again, tobacco has these very important ancillary roles uh, to be used alongside these other uh, powerful plants as well. Uh, Antonio, do you have another question? Yeah, we do. Um, one from one of our audience members, George, um, is asking, um, would, he'd like to know the way that flowers of tobacco are used. I've never seen tobacco flowers used per se, other than as an ornamental. Those of you who know the plant, who've grown the plant, it's really quite a beautiful plant, pink and white flowers. But I've never seen them use the active principle as typically the leaves and to a lesser extent, the stems. Uh, as an ethnobotanist, you learn to never say never because you'll say, well, there's no hallucinogenic mushrooms in Mexico, despite the fact that the chronicles from the conquistadors in the 1500s 
uh, had a, a, ample documentation of the fact that they were using magic mushrooms from the Aztecs down into Oaxaca. But people said, no, they don't use them until Schultes went down there in 38 and found out that indeed they did. So the short answer is no use. Uh, the more nuanced and probably more correct answer is, well, I haven't seen it or read of it, but that doesn't mean it, it doesn't happen. Now, I want to read a quote because I love the literature of this field and want to share uh, some of these great quotes with you. This is one of my favorites. There's a wonderful book called Wicked Plants by Amy Stewart, who writes about medicinal hallucinogenic toxic plants. Amy Stewart wrote in 2009 about tobacco, quote, a leaf so toxic, it has taken the lives of 90 million people worldwide, so potent that it can kill through skin contact alone, so addictive that it fueled war against Native Americans, so powerful that it led to the establishment of slavery in the American South, and so lucrative that it spawned a global industry worth $300 billion. So there's a lot written about tobacco, but I think there's a lot more to say as we better understand the shamanic use, um, which is being documented more all the time. I don't understand why ethnobotanists like myself have long not considered tobacco to be hallucinogen. I suspect the answer is dosage. And when you take as much as some of the shamans like the Machi Genghis and the Peruvian Amazon do, you do see other things. You do travel to other worlds but there aren't many tribes that are as devoted to taking as much of it as groups like the Machi Genga are. And again, I want to refer you to the papers by Glenn Shepard, which are mentioned in the end notes of the tobacco episode on Plants of the Gods podcast, available on a variety of uh, platforms now. I want to talk a little bit about the etymology, the, the, the words, the wording around the use of tobacco because it's particularly bizarre and, and, and fun. When the two Spaniards I mentioned, uh, de Torres and Jerez, the shipmates of Columbus, came back from the interior of Cuba in, in 1492 and tried to tell the others about how the Indians were drinking the smoke or eating the smoke. They didn't really know what they were looking at. And so they said that uh, the Indians were eating or drinking the smoke of tobacco. And now we think of tobacco as the herb, but apparently the Taino word uh, is uh, tobacco means cigar, so that they got it wrong. And that um, their word for, the correct word for tobacco in the Taino language is actually cohiba, C-O-H-I-B-A. And cohiba now is the brand of expensive uh, cigars, uh, hence the confusion. And the Taino language has given us a, a few words in English that we use commonly, barbecue, canoe, hammock. Those are all Taino words. And I invite our Taino colleagues who are tuning in, because we have quite the following among, in, uh, in the community, of, of correcting me if I'm wrong. But this is based on what I've been told and, and, and the language, the words derived from the Taino language as I understand them. But the coolest and most confused word of all is cigar. Okay, we all know what a cigar is. But if, if you speak Spanish or you've traveled in Latin America, cigarro uh, doesn't mean what we call a cigar. It means uh, cicada. You know, cicadas, those funny insects, big honking insects. So why would we call a cigar a cicada or a cicada a cigar? Well, in Spanish, cicada's name is cigar. But when they were planting tobacco in the New World in, in Spain, since the original inhabitants, the original colonists, the original invaders from Europe were, were Spaniards, they brought some of the tobacco seeds back and they planted it near Toledo. And the area that it did best was across the Tagus River, the Rio Tagus. Uh, it was frequented by uh, cicadas. And so they started calling the product uh, cigarros, um, even though uh, you wouldn't want to really want to smoke these bugs. But think about it. A cigar looks something like a cicada. They're dark colored. They're swollen in the middle and tapered at the ends. 
So that's my understanding of where the word uh, cigar comes from. And I know that not all of you all tune in for these things all along, so I want to share the biggest breaking news in, in ethnobotany world about tobacco is that uh, a fellow by, by the name of Darren Duke uh, discovered tobacco use 12,000 years ago, 12,300 years ago in northwestern Utah. So this is mind-boggling. For a lot of reasons, it means that uh, tobacco is the oldest known shamanic plant in the New World, as far as we know. It also means that tobacco was cultivated uh, at least as long ago as other plants like corn, and possibly even longer. And as I said earlier, tobacco was cultivated from southern Alaska to northern Chile. And the only other plant that spanned that range in pre-Columbian times was corn, maize to Europeans. So clearly this was something that was very important to the local cultures. And I want to ask uh, Antonio if we have another question. Yes, we do. Um, one of our questions that we got from Violetta, um, it's asking, can you comment about the herb pericon or tagetes lucida, excuse my pronunciation, uh, called the herb of Tlaloc? And it uses, or and it's used in tobacco blends in ancient Mexico, and allegedly contains alkaloids. I can repeat that again. Say that again. What's the name of the plant? Here it says herb pericon, or mm -hmm. tagetes lucida, mm -hmm. the herb of Tlaloc. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't recognize it. I. I, I might under a oh tagetes yes. Um, that is one of the plants that's considered uh, essentially a minor hallucinogen. It wasn't, I mean, it clearly wasn't used from Alaska to Chile, but as we saw in our section on ayahuasca, that these admixtures can do different things. They can cause a particular type of vision. It can lengthen the visions. And some of these things sometimes have their own alkaloids or other chemical compounds that can be mind altering on their own. To those of you out there looking to pursue careers in ethnobotany, I think the study of these other plants uh, would be a very fruitful one. For example, in terms of ayahuasca, there's a hundred different plants used as admixtures. Some of them we know to be chemically active. Most of them are considered chemically inert. So the question is in the lab, would they potentiate complex chemical reactions? In other words, would they make the ayahuasca more hallucinogenic or would they give you visions of animals? or spirits or what have you. So this is indeed a very important aspect that needs to be further researched, not just in lab, but particularly amongst local peoples to find out what they're using before these uh, uses disappear, which is always a problem. And now actually there's another sort of odd problem that I don't think most ethnobots anticipated, that these traditional uses are being swamped by other uses. There's many tribes in the Amazon now using ayahuasca and I'm convinced it didn't do so, you know, in pre-Columbian times or even 50 years ago. So the question is, what's traditional? And I think it's essential that we document the original uses um, long before too late to tell. I mean, ayahuasca, it's used from Israel to Indonesia uh, to Istanbul these days. Somebody wrote recently that there isn't a day that goes by anymore where somebody's not doing an ayahuasca ceremony somewhere. And uh, just to tie it back into tobacco, tobacco is the most widely used mind-altering plant in the world. Tobacco was discovered, discovered uh, by Europeans in 1492. Within a hundred years, European explorers in the most remote parts of northeastern Siberia, the other side of the world, found local peoples smoking tobacco because it was so popular and so addictive. So no plant has been moved around as much or as fast as tobacco, which speaks to its incredible uh, appeal. Other questions, Antonio? Yeah, we have one in from Lawrence Curtis. And the question is, mapachos, what exactly are they? And yep. of course, rape, are they pure tobacco or mixed uh, with other plants? There's more research that needs to be done on these. Uh, mapacho or the cigarettes smoked by ayahuasca shamans in the Western Amazon, particularly Peru. 
uh, in my experience and observation, they tend to be mestizos or campesinos, peasants, uh, much more than the indigenous peoples using it. And rape, which you have to be careful to spell correctly, it's R-A-P-E, but make sure you put the ascending accent over the final E. Uh, I, again, that's an increasingly common stuff. You can buy it on the internet. Um, I believe that the major component in these is nicotine aristica. Remember, that's the one that has 10 times more nicotine than tobacco. But these are not hard and fast rules. I also want to refer you to a recent book that I like a lot, uh, Plant Teachers. This is written by ethnobotanist Jeremy Narby and his indigenous colleague, Rafael Pizzuri. It's a recent book. It says, Plant Teachers, Ayahuasca, Tobacco, and the Pursuit of Knowledge. And this really undergirds what I was saying earlier about how tobacco is really, it's a companion plant. And the book is about both ayahuasca and tobacco and how they're used together. And, and, and these guys make the point that tobacco, like most of the plants of the gods, can heal and can hurt. But they also make the point that uh, commercial cigarettes uh, often have all sorts of nasty things in them. So ideally, you should be growing your own or at least smoking the, uh, smoking the organic version because you're really getting a lot of nasty stuff when you buy commercial cigarettes and cigars. And I also want to point out that when you buy stuff on the internet, uh, that could be even worse. You don't know what's in it, you know? Uh, adulteration is, 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 is an old game. And especially when you deal with mind altering plants, people put all kinds of stuff in there to jack things up. And that's ayahuasca, that's, that's uh, tobacco. So uh, to quote uh, the ancient Romans, let the buyer beware. And growing your own, is uh, the only way you can guarantee that you're getting the clean stuff. But that's another lecture. Uh, other questions, Antonio? Yes. Um, another question, um, a short one, is what is the tobacco hornworm? Yes, tobacco hornworm. This is very cool. You know, I did an episode of Plants of the Gods called Plant, Plants of the Apes the plant planets of the apes. And the focus was on medicinal use of plants by animals. And the backbone of the story was chimpanzees because I was clued into this by my uh, old friend and mentor, Jane Goodall, who's speaking in Miami uh, next week. So any of you guys in Southern Florida, you want to see Jane. I don't know why she hasn't won the, the Nobel Peace Prize. We're all hoping for that. But uh, the, the, the point here being that animal use of plants is much less appreciated and understudied. And that the shamans tell me that some of the medicinal plants they use, they learn because the animals are using them. But it ain't just, it ain't just uh, monkeys or primates. For example, the tobacco hornworm is so named because it feeds on tobacco plants. Now tobacco plants are full of nicotine. Why do plants create nicotine or uh, morphine or caffeine? And the answer is to deter attacks by insects. So how can you have this caterpillar living off a plant that produces this toxic compound? And the answer is the tobacco hornworm has developed the internal chemistry to denature tobacco. So it doesn't die from nicotine intoxication, but it goes one step further. It's all able to hold on enough of the nicotine that it can exhale it and it does so to keep away predatory spiders. So this is why ethnobotanists don't need to read science fiction because nature is full of wonders and mysteries and, and surprises like the fact that the tobacco hornworm figured how to use nicotine for its own benefit long before we did. And that uh, another example of that is I don't know if you guys have read um, Papillon, who was a Frenchman unjustly accused, that's a bit unclear if he was accurate, uh, and shipped to Devil's Island, the penal colony off the coast of French Guiana, where I've spent time, northeastern South America. And he talked about escaping, and then when you end up on shore, you're in the mangrove swamps. Mangrove swamps are one of the most bug-ridden places in the world. And the way they survived before they could get further enough inland to get away from it 
was they took tobacco and they rubbed it on their faces and their hands because the bugs are terrible. And uh, having read that book as a, as a kid growing up, uh, being in a whitewater river area, and I cover this in my book, Amazon, which you see over this shoulder right there, the Amazon, what everybody needs to know. Uh, I talk about how whitewater river is the most bug infested part of the Amazon. And if I'm in whitewater river, I always bring cigarettes or cigars with me because if the bugs get too bad, you just light it up and that keeps the bugs at bay. So again, the use of these uh, plants and these plant products uh, is multifaceted. Any other questions, uh, Antonio, you want to share with me? Yes. Um, can you share with us what some of the therapeutic properties of tobacco are? Well, tobacco has many therapeutic properties, and I list them in the in the uh, tobacco episode. So, you know, tune into that for a complete listing. But I will say that two of the most important are it reduces stress, calms you down, and it suppresses appetite. And here's proof of that. Look at pictures of soldiers coming out of battle and see how many of them have cigarettes between their fingers or are smoking uh, a cigar. Because it suppresses appetite and it calms you down. Two things you definitely eat coming out of battle. And so it's, it, it's important not to paint tobacco as this you know, terrible plant that's caused all these cancer deaths, which it has, but to show that there's a therapeutic aspect as well. And, and let me talk a bit about the, the shamanic importance of this, because I want to circle back to where we started. The Zapato people on the Peru-Ecuador border say they take ayahuasca to see better, but believe that their true power comes from smoking tobacco. The Tarahumara one of the three major peyote tribes, and I talked about this in our peyote episode, they were studied by Bob Bai, who was one of Schulte's first uh, graduate students. And Bob Bai said that tobacco was second in importance to the Tarahumara, second importance only to peyote, which is their most sacred plant. And Johannes Wilbert, who wrote the classic book on tobacco and shamanism in South America, said that tobacco is a transformation agent that is, when shamans claim the ability to transform themselves into jaguars and roam the jungle at night, it's tobacco that makes that possible. And if you listen to the interview coming up with uh, Glenn Shepard in an upcoming episode of Plants of the Gods, you'll hear him detail uh, exactly how they go about it. So I'm reminded by my team to remind everybody out there to tell us where you're dialing in from, because I know we have a number of new people who signed on uh more recently so please put in the chat where you're uh, listening in from and i also invite you to uh, make suggestions or requests about where you'd like to focus other upcoming episodes other plants of the gods and just to wind up on that question from antonio that tobacco is clinically proven to ease pain enhance cognition reduce stress and suppress appetite and there's lots more stuff attributed to it as well. One of the most ironic things is when tobacco was first taken to Europe, it was promoted as a cure for cancer. I mean, imagine that. And we tend to think of tobacco really, our understanding of tobacco was in the 60s when they started doing these lab work and found out that tobacco was a major source of cancer, particularly lung cancer. Hola Julio, bienvenido. That uh, tobacco was definitely the cause of uh, these forms of cancer. But one of the ironies in putting together this episode was there's a report from England, 1761. A scientist by the name of Hill said that tobacco and tobacco smoking was a cause of cancer. So this whole idea, well, we didn't really know until a few decades ago, that's just BS. This was figured out a long time ago. But the tobacco industry and an act of, of really of pure evil suppresses so stuff, a lot more people died as a result. If you haven't seen it, there's a fabulous film called The Insider, starring Russell Crowe, about one of the first whistleblowers who went public, and the, uh, the, the, the problems that accrued through the suppression of the tobacco industry. But again, tobacco wasn't beloved by everybody until the 1960s. King James, who's best known as the author, or, or the fellow who, uh, paid for the translation of the Bible into the King's English. King James I hated tobacco. And he wrote 
uh, one of my favorite quotes about tobacco. It's called a counterblast to tobacco. Let me quote it. Quote, it is a custom loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs, and in the black stinking fume thereof, nearest resembling the horrible Stygian smoke of the pit that is bottomless. <laughs> Benjamin Waterhouse, a physician during revolutionary times, one of the founders of Harvard Medical School, and most famous in the medical world as the fellow who introduced the practice of, of vaccination here in the States, and he proved it worked by trying it on his own family. How bold is that? He wrote about tobacco along the lines of King James, but he did it with a much lighter touch. Let me quote it. Tobacco was an Indian weed. It was the devil sowed the seed. It drains the pocket, singes the clothes, and makes a chimney of the nose. Do we have any more questions? Uh, Antonio, as, as we are starting to wind up this evening. Yes, here, let's end on, I just saw one come in, one from Danny, and it says, could you speak to tobacco as a sacrament or similar in holy books as the Bible, such as the Bible? Well, tobacco is certainly a sacrament amongst these tribes. It's considered a sacred plant. It's a rite of passage. It's used to communicate with the spirit world. It's used physically as a curative agent or agent of protection, like the example I gave from Oaxaca. So it is considered sacred by many of these tribes. And the tribe that I know best that I've been working with for almost four decades, the trios in the Northeast Amazon, were forbidden to grow it and smoke it by the missionaries, by the fundamentalist missionaries, which speaks to the important role it had in shamanic cultures. So, uh, you know, I believe in live and let live and, and let people practice their own religion. But when I see uh, people from one religion going in to another and saying, I don't care if it's your sacrament, you can't do it. It's the God, it's the devil's work, yada, yada, yada. Um, I have a problem with that. So it was clearly a sacred plant. It was clearly a healing plant. It was clearly the shaman's plant. And these people went to great lengths to uh, stomp it out. Now, I want to finish with the greatest rivalry in the history of tobacco because it's such a wonderful story. This is a French diplomat known as uh, André Tevé, and he was the one who brought tobacco seeds to France from South America as early as 1556. He's actually a, a Franciscan priest. However, four years later, the, another French diplomat, Jean Nicot, uh, brought tobacco to France and began marketing as a cure for everything. So a rivalry sprung up by these guys as to who was the first. Well, we know from the historical record that Thivé beat Nicot by four years. However, the issue was settled by Linnaeus, the father of scientific classification, when he named the genus of tobacco Nicotiana. In other words, he honored, he honored Nicot rather than Thivé, despite that the fact that Thivé had brought it uh, four years earlier. And when the scientists, hundreds of years later, first isolated uh, the active principle in tobacco, this was done by German chemists, uh, they called the compound nicotine. So once again, Nico will live forever. Everybody knows the term nicotine or nicotiana, and nobody knows poor Thive, who actually brought it four years earlier. Any comments as we wind up there, uh, Antonio? I think that's about it. Um, okay. Time here. Well, let me thank all of our listeners and my request to all of you, if you've enjoyed this or, or the other Facebook Live or the podcast, uh, help us get the word out. I encourage your friends and colleagues, like-minded souls, to tune in. Uh, these Facebook Lives live forever, This, even though we're all here live. Uh, they go up on YouTube. So anyone you want to revisit or recommend or send to somebody else or the others we've done on rum and Pirates of the Caribbean, stuff like that. But, you know, we're trying to get the word out on the value of indigenous wisdom, on how much more these indigenous peoples know than scientists and PhDs and MDs in some cases. 
uh, the importance of protecting forests around the world, particularly the Amazon, which is the mission of the Amazon conservation team. We work in partnership with indigenous peoples of South America to help them protect their forests and their culture. We have the honor and privilege of having worked with over a hundred different tribes. Um, we have been able to help them map and improve the management of over 90 million acres of ancestral rainforest. I challenge any rainforest conservation organization to be able to uh, show and they've done a better job. We have set up and run the longest running indigenous park guard forest in the Amazon over a decade long. We have very successful programs with empowering indigenous women. We have brought, I think, seven non-timber forest products to market. So in other words, people were able to put a little money in their pocket or their breech cloth based on their local plants, not having to go off and work in the gold mines. And there's many, many other innovative and creative solutions we either implemented or trying to implement in partnership with our indigenous guides and teachers. So I encourage everybody to check out our website, www.amazonteam.org. I encourage those of you who are able to do so to support our efforts. You know, we don't do direct mail. We don't call you up at dinner and ask you for more money. The only way we get the word out on our efforts is through efforts like these. One thing I want to emphasize, because we're all particularly proud of this at the Amazon Conservation Team in Deb Mitchell, there's no commercials. You know, you don't tune in to hear about shamans and tobacco and ayahuasca and have six minutes hearing about electric blankets and uh, the, the NFL lottery. Never have, never will. So um, help us uh, be able to continue with supporting our efforts and helping us get the word out. So I want to send out a special thank you to all of our listeners uh, from Australia to Colombia to Mexico, even the good old U.S. of A. and everywhere in between. Stay tuned. We've got other great stuff coming up on the podcast, other stuff on Facebook Live. And you can always go to our webpage uh, and submit questions or comments. Uh, we welcome them. So thank you again. And I look forward to seeing you next time.